Welcome to Building Character, the show where we figure out how to play as your favorite fictional characters in Dungeons & Dragons. We'll be using 5th edition statistics and all books related to it. Last week we built a Guardian of Light, today we'll be building a Knight of the Dark. A Knight Knight, if you will. That's right, today we're building Bruce Wayne, aka Batman. Created by Bob Kane and Bill Finger in 1939, Batman is the world's greatest detective, a founding member of the Justice League, and number one on the Child Protective Service's Most Wanted list. Let's get started by making a list of things we need to accomplish. Number one, he's gotta be smart. Bruce's intelligence is the closest thing he has to a superpower. Well, maybe second closest. Where does he get those wonderful toys? We'll figure out how to get some of his most frequently used gadgets, but might not be able to get all of them, so don't hold out for shark repellent. Lastly, we're going to make sure that he's a hand-to-hand -hand expert. For stats, we'll be using a standard point buy in the player's handbook. That's 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, and 8. If you or your DM would rather have you roll stats, that's fine too. Just use this as a guide for where to put your highest and your lowest. Start off with intelligence. Bruce Wayne is nothing short of a genius. Next up, dexterity. He's a trained ninja, after all. Follow that up with wisdom, interrogations require insight, and seeing at night requires good perception. Next, go for charisma to achieve the intimidation factor of the Dark Knight. Strength is up next, Batman isn't a weakling, but considering he hangs out next to Wonder Woman and Superman, he looks a little wiry by comparison. It's fine, we don't really need strength for this build anyway. Lastly, and I swear we won't do this often, we're dumping Constitution. Warning, Tulak does not condone dumping Constitution. This is a very rare exception. If you dump Constitution, you will die. Reminder, friends don't let friends dump con. In all seriousness though, Batman's biggest weakness is his very obvious weaknesses. Bullets, knives, dogs, dogs with knives, the list goes on. He is only human after all. Speaking of human, let's choose a race. We'll choose variant human again. It's versatile and accurate. You get a feat, and we're taking a bunch of them, so start with Skulker. This lets you hide with light obscurity. It lets you see in dim light without disadvantage. You also don't lose stealth if you miss a creature with a ranged attack. Use your two free points to round off odd numbers. Focus on intelligence, wisdom, and dexterity. Our goal for these stats is 16 in each. Pick a language, any language, anything from abyssal to undercommon. Lastly, you get a free skill of choice. Take intimidation. We need a lot of skills, and this is certainly one of them. For background, Bruce Wayne is a noble. It gives you 25 starting gold, a free language, and proficiency with history and persuasion. You can also take the variant feature, Retainers, which gives you a group of three common people who run errands for you. But really, you only need one, and his name is Alfred. Now that we have that set up, let's get into level one. You'll want to start as a rogue. This gives you four skill proficiencies from a select list. Take Investigation, Insight, Acrobatics, and Stealth. You also get expertise on two skills, which means you get double your proficiency for those skills. Choose Investigation and Insight. These are both great for role-playing, and one will actually have an impact in combat as well. More on that later. You also get proficiency with light armor, simple weapons, hand crossbows, and swords. First level rogues also can read and write Thieves' Camp. Chalk that up to Batman's studying of the criminal underbelly. Lastly, rogues get sneak attack, which allows you to add 1d6 to any damage roll you have advantage on, or if an ally is within 5 feet of you. You can only do this once per turn. Next, we'll take a level of monk. This gives you unarmored defense, which means your AC is 10, plus your wisdom and dexterity mods, if you're not wearing armor. So throw on your stealthiest cloak and get ready to protect the city. I'm not wearing hockey pants. You can also use martial arts, meaning you can use your dexterity instead of your strength for unarmed strikes, which, by the way, now deal 1d4 and can be made as a bonus action after using a monk weapon or a first unarmed strike. Bouncing back to rogue for the next level gives you cunning action, meaning you can dash, disengage, or hide as a bonus action. Dashing doubles your movement, disengaging safely moves you out of melee range with an enemy, and hiding makes a stealth check against the enemy's perception in order to gain advantage on attacks and be unseen to the attacker. It's really good, but you can't do this if your DM doesn't think you could reasonably hide, so it's kind of up to them. Third level rogues increase their sneak attack damage to 2d6 instead of 1. You also get a roguish archetype. Take the Inquisitor archetype from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. It allows you to use a bonus action to make a perception check to find a hidden enemy or investigation to check for clues. It's a little weird to do this during a combat round, but hey, no judgments here. 
More importantly, you get Insightful Fighting, allowing you to use a bonus action to make an insight check against your target's charisma slash deception check. If you succeed, you can use your sneak attack damage once per turn for the next minute or 10 combat rounds on that target. Keep in mind, you only have one bonus action per round, meaning you can make an unarmed strike, dash, disengage, hide, or activate Insightful Fighting, but only one at a time. Next, we finally get to add some stuff to that utility belt. Fourth level rogues get an ability score improvement or a feat, you're taking Magic Initiate. This allows you to take two cantrips and a first level spell from the spell list of a bard, cleric, druid, sorcerer, warlock, or wizard. You can cast the first level spell once per long rest. Batman actually needs some druid spells for his utility belt. Take Thorn Whip. It's a melee spell attack, which means that you add your proficiency bonus and your wisdom modifier to your attack roll. It deals 1d6 piercing damage and brings the target up to 10 feet closer to you, provided its size is large or smaller. This is the combat application of a grappling hook. Next, take Resistance. You spend one action to grant yourself or an ally an extra d4 that they can add to their next saving throw for up to one minute, unless you lose concentration. Chalk this up to Batman's constant preparation. For the first level spell, take Fog Cloud. It creates a 20-foot sphere of fog that heavily obscures the area. It can last for up to an hour, unless some wind blows it away or you lose concentration. You can throw this smoke bomb up to 120 feet away, and it only takes one action to set up. Now that your gadgets are up and running, we'll start getting some more monk levels. Second level monks get two key points, which allow you to do some neat things. Flurry of Blows costs one key point and lets you make two unarmed attacks instead of one as a bonus action. Patient Defense costs one key point and lets you dodge as a bonus action. This means that the next attack against you has disadvantage to hit, so it's pretty good. Step of the Wind lets you dash or disengage as a bonus action, but you've already been able to do that since level 2 of Rogue, so never waste a point on this, you only have two points at this level. You also get Unarmored Movement, which allows you to move an extra 10 feet if you're not wearing hockey pads. I mean, armor. This increases more as you level up and gets really good at level 9. More on that later. Let's keep that monk train rolling. Level 3 gives you deflect missiles. This means that you can use your reaction to reduce the damage of ranged weapon attacks made against you. Roll 1d10, then add your dexterity modifier and your monk level, and that's the amount of damage you're able to reduce. If you drop the damage to zero, you can spend a key point to toss whatever was fired at you back at the enemy. The attack modifier here is your dex modifier plus your proficiency. You can also take a monastic tradition. Take Path of the Kensai from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. The most important reason is for Way of the Brush, which allows Bruce Wayne proficiency with calligraphers tools. Just kidding, but you do get that. Firstly, you get Kensai weapons, which allows you to make one melee weapon a monk weapon. I'd go for a whip. It has finesse and reach and deals 1d4. You also get a ranged weapon that can count as a monk weapon. I'd call a throwing dagger a battering and punch people after you throw it. Next, you get the Agile Parry, this means that you can add two to your AC after you've made an unarmed strike and are holding a Kensai weapon, like a Batarang, until the start of your next turn. Finally, you get Kensai Shot, meaning you can use your bonus action to add 1d4 to your ranged attack. Keep in mind, you can't use a cunning action or any other bonus action if you do this. Evening out with a fourth level of monk grants you Slow Fall, which allows you to reduce falling damage by five times your monk level. Typical falling damage is 1d6 for every 10 feet, so even at level 4 you can jump from 30 feet or higher and it will automatically deal no damage. We'll also get another ability score improvement, but you know we're all about the feats here. Take the menacing feat from the Unearthed Arcana Feats for Skills, you can look that up online. It gives you plus 1 charisma, doubles your proficiency on intimidation checks, basically a free expertise and allows you to replace an attack action with an intimidation check. The target can test this with their insight, but if they fail, they're frightened. Frightened creatures have disadvantage on attack rolls while in line of sight with you and can't willingly move closer to you. There are spells that do this, but you don't have to use a spell. You can just do it for free. Fifth level monk lets you make an extra attack every time you take the attack action. For other classes, this is pretty simple, but there tends to be a lot of confusion about monks, so let's clear this up. Your action is attacking twice. This can either be with a monk weapon or an unarmed attack. Next is your bonus action, which you can use either for one unarmed strike or two if you spend a key point. If you're making those unarmed strikes, you can't take other bonus actions. Dashing, disengaging, insightful fighting, dodging, or Kensai shotting. 
Bing. Yes, you have a lot of bonus action options. That just means that if you don't take one, you're being a little inefficient. It's not very Batman. You also gain access to Stunning Strike, which allows you to spend a key point to stun an enemy you strike. They make a constitution saving throw against your Monk DC, which is 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your wisdom modifier. A stunned opponent automatically fails strength and dex saves, attacks against them have advantage, and they can't take actions or reactions. Additionally, your martial arts die is now a D6 instead of a D4. Level 5 Monk is pretty good. Let's stick with Monk for a few more levels. Level 6 grants you key empowered strikes and key empowered Kensai weapons. This means that if something resists physical damage from non-magical things, that no longer means you. Think of it as a kryptonite lining on the inside of your suit. You also can spend one key point to add one D6 to your Kensai weapon attacks with Deft Strike. Keep in mind this is something you can only do once per turn. Oh, and you get an additional 15 feet of movement per round thanks to unarmored movement. Level 7 monks get evasion, meaning that anytime you make a deck save to avoid damage, you take half that damage on failed saves, and no damage on successful ones. Additionally, you get stillness of mind, meaning you can use an action to remove an effect of charm or frighten, but not both on the same turn. Player's Handbook clarifies that, though I don't know if charmed and frightened effects overlap all that often. 8th level monk is an ability score improvement, we're actually going to take it. Round off odd numbers, focus on getting intelligence, dexterity, and wisdom up to 16. Ninth level improves your unarmored movement, not by adding feet, but instead by allowing you to climb vertical surfaces and move along water without falling. This is your grappling hook. If you dash with your bonus action, you can climb a 90 foot building, and if you dash with your full action, you can climb a 135 foot building, or 12 stories if you're using Gotham City measurements. So at this point, we've got gadgets, grappling hooks, batarangs, stealth, intimidation, really everything we need to be the Cape Crusader. But I have no impulse control, so we're taking this build all the way to 20. Moving back to Rogue from here on out, and we'll get all the things that are nice if they're a little excessive. Fifth level Rogue increases your sneak attack damage to 3d6, in addition to uncanny dodge, which allows you to reduce damage by half with a reaction as long as you can see your attacker. Next level gives you expertise on two more skills, choose acrobatics and stealth. Quick reminder that your proficiency bonus is now plus five, so for all your expertise skills, that's everything but history and persuasion, you have plus ten minimum. It's a good thing you get another sneak attack die for level seven of rogue because the other reward is evasion, which you already have. Unfortunately, these effects don't stack. You still get half damage on failed deck saves and zero damage on successful deck saves, but that's still really good. Level eight rogues get another ability score improvement. Odd numbers get rounded up. Intelligence, dexterity, and wisdom are your priorities. You understand that by now. Level nine gives you steady eye from the inquisitor archetype. This means that you have advantage on perception and investigation checks if you haven't moved more than 22 feet on your turn. If you're not in combat, this basically translates to free advantage on two of the most used skills in the game. World's greatest detective, indeed. Level 10 is another ability score improvement, and really do whatever you think is best here, I'm sure you understand how this works by now. Level 11 Rogue is actually Batman's last level, and here he gets reliable talent. This means that any skill you're proficient with, you can't roll anything lower than a 10. You can extrapolate that to mean that any intimidation, investigation, insight, acrobatics, or stealth checks are never lower than 22, ignoring modifiers in case you rolled for your stats and all of them were low. That insight check translates to combat as well with your insightful fighting, meaning it succeeds unless the target gets a 22 or higher on their deception check. That's really high. Now that we've hit level 20, let's talk about how viable of a build this is. First of all, Bruce Wayne has the skills to pay the bills, in addition to actual money to pay the bills. Proficiency with seven skills, expertise with five, three of which you can bring into combat, and yeah, rogues make great skill monkeys, what else is new? In combat, you're super mobile, running up walls, disengaging, dashing whenever you want, dodging up to nine times as a bonus action, as long as you don't use your key points anywhere else. This helps him get his sneak attack on, not that insightful fighting wouldn't get it done, meaning he's dealing up to 66 plus nine damage per turn, if he gets his sneak attack, that is. Finally, he's got a pretty good armor class at 16 or 18 if you use your reaction thanks to that Kensai ability. He can also reduce damage as a reaction with uncanny dodge if you think that you definitely took the hit. Speaking of taking hits, weaknesses. Remember at the beginning when we dumped Constitution? Yeah, that was bad. 
This build caps out at less than 100 HP unless you're really lucky with those dice rolls. Additionally, you're susceptible to poison, disease, cold, anything else that requires constitution. He also suffers from an embarrassment of riches in terms of bonus actions and reactions. There are so many options, but he can only choose one. This is a frequent side effect of multi-glassing, so keep that in mind when you're making your own funky builds. Overall, if this is Gotham's defender, Gotham's probably in pretty good shape. Ideally, Batman should be able to take out any enemies before they find him, and if they do, he should be able to run away. Just keep in mind, he's used to a certain lifestyle and won't do nearly as well without someone taking care of his health. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe if you like the video. We make new videos every week. Next week, we're going to be doing one of the greatest heroes of all time, so be sure to check that out.